This lesson is for FST Lesson 7-8 on factoring by grouping. There's two types of factoring by grouping that will be covered in this video. That is factoring by chunking and factoring by substitution. So there's two types of grouping. The first type we're going to look at is factoring by chunking. Chunking is not an official mathematical term. Uh, it's just a word that's very easily applied to the type of factoring that you'll see in this first example. When you see that you have a polynomial that has more than three terms, grouping should be one of the options that you think about using. And as you're looking at it, you want to see if you can, I guess, essentially cut that in half, cut that polynomial in half. And so you want to see if there's GCFs for the first two terms and for the last two terms. That's kind of visually how you would track whether or not you're going to use this type of factoring. So as you look at this one, we're going to chunk it or cut it into two halves. And I'm going to find the GCF for the part that I rewrote here in dark blue and the part that I wrote here in light blue. So I did the GCF for x cubed minus 3x squared and I got x squared. And then I found what was left. So this is just a little mini GCF factoring going on right here. We do the same thing over here for the 4x and the 12. Keep in mind that you may or may not use this negative sign when you factor out the number. So know that you may play around with that negative to get the numbers to work out. And when I mean the numbers have to work out, the thing that you end up getting inside the parentheses when you do chunking needs to be identical in both cases. So if you factor out something here and then when you factor it over here you have the opposite sign, then you'll need to change the sign of this number that you're pulling out. So sometimes you'll pull out a negative, sometimes you'll pull out a positive, regardless of whatever this sign is here. So now that I've factored out a GCF from each piece, each half of this polynomial, I'm going to take the two things that I pulled out, so x squared and negative 4, I'm, and I'm going to turn those into a factor as well. Because x minus 3 appears in both, it's like I'm now factoring out x squared minus 4 from both, and I'm going to see what's left. So if I pull out x squared minus 4, I'm left with x minus 3 in both cases. So now I use those as my two factors. Then hopefully you recognize that x squared minus 4 can be factored further because that's a difference of squares. So that factors into x plus and x minus a 2. And then the x minus 3 is still sitting there. Number one question that students usually have at this point is why isn't x minus 3 in there twice? So I want you to think about it like the distributive property. If I had AX, excuse me, AC plus BC, wouldn't you factor out the C there and you'd get A plus B? You wouldn't get A plus B multiple times and you don't get C multiple times. C gets pulled out and then you see what's left. So in this case, the C on the left is behaving like the X minus 3. That's the thing that you're looking at twice. So that gets factored out only once and then you see what's left and what's left gets put together. Let's try another example. Let's try to factor that polynomial. Again, we're going to kind of visually cut it in half, so almost like I'm cutting it into two separate pieces. And I'm going to find the GCF of each of the first two pieces and then the last two pieces. So I try to find something that's in common between 27 and 45. Remember that you're doing the greatest common factor, so you want to find the largest. In this case, the largest factor there would be a 9. And then between x cubed and x squared, I can pull out an x squared out of both of those. Now I want to see what's left. So 9x squared times what is 27x cubed? That's going to be 3x. 9x squared times what is 45x squared? And that's going to be a 5. And then I have a minus in between. So now I'm going to see if I can factor out something over here. And I want whatever I get inside the parentheses to mimic what I just got, 3x minus 5. So just keep that in mind that, that we're going to hopefully see that again. So now I'm going to look at 12x or maybe negative 12x and 20 and see what they have in common. They're both even, so 2 would be a common factor, but I want to pick the greatest. So the greatest would be a 4 here. Keep in mind that I might make that a negative 4 if I need to. If I pull out a 4 and multiply it here, I'm going to get I need to get a 12x, so I'm going to say 3x here. So far, so good. 
but remember I need that to make a negative so I am going to pull out a negative here and make that a negative 4 that I pull out. Even though the negative is not common to both, I need it to be negative in order to get my positive 3x on the inside. So you're going to play around with that a little bit. Now I need to do negative 4 times what is 20, and that's going to need to be a negative 5. So even if you didn't catch it when you did the 3, you'd catch it here when you did the 5. We need that 5 to be a minus, so in order for that to work, I need a positive 20, so both factors need to be a negative. So now I've got my answer. Keep in mind that this is actually behaving like a subtraction sign right now, but it could essentially be a negative 4. So now I'm going to pull out the thing that's in common, in this case 3x minus 5, and I'm going to see what's left after I pull that out. If I pull that out of both terms, I'm left with 9x squared minus 4 as the other term. Again, look for anything that can be factored further. 9x squared minus 4 can be factored further into difference of squares. 3x and 2 and 3x and 2 again, one with a plus, one with a minus. And then I just repeat my 3x minus 5 as my other factor. So I'd like you to try one now and then I'll have you pause the video and then the answer will appear shortly. So again you would cut it in half, pull out a GCF for the first two, pull out a GCF for the second two. GCF at the beginning here is x, you're left with x plus y. GCF over here is indeed a negative w because that's common to both. And then what's left inside is another x plus y. If you pull out x plus y from both of those, you're left with x minus w. So then there's your two factors. Our other topic today is factoring by substitution. It's technically another factoring by grouping situation. All you're going to do here is use another letter to temporarily simplify. And so on these, you want to look for something that's repeated. So if you look here, I've got x squared minus 2 as showing up in two sets of parentheses. So what I want to do is label that something else and pull it out and see what's left. Usually here for substitution we use the letter U, but know that you can use whatever letter you want other than the letter that's already there. So don't use an X, use something else. Typically we do use U for substitution. So I'm going to replace, anytime I see X squared minus 2, I'm going to replace that with the letter U and I'm going to see what happens. So if I take out X squared minus 2 and I replace it with a U, don't I get U squared there? Same thing here, if I take out this part in the parentheses, I'm left with just a 2u and a minus 24. Let me just slide this over so it looks a little bit better. Now I'm going to try to factor that. So the x squared minus 2 is still there, I'm just not thinking about it right now. So now I'm going to factor this. Hopefully you know that that is a trinomial with a leading coefficient of 1, so I would do the diamond here to try to solve. Factors of negative 24 that add up to 2. So the numbers that work there are 6 and negative 4, or negative 4 and 6. So when I factor there, I'm going to get u plus 6 and u minus 4. I can't factor any further. That's as far as I can go. So now I'm going to plug the u that I substituted in at first. I'm going to plug that back in. So now the u gets re-replaced with what it was originally. So now I'm going to say x squared minus 2 plus 6 for the first chunk, and this u gets replaced again with x squared minus 2, and then there's still a minus 4 there. So all I did was yank out the u's and put back in my x squared minus 2 that I had substituted out at the beginning. These can be simplified, obviously, so I'm going to get x squared plus 4 on the first one, just simplifying the 2 and the 6. Same thing here, I'm going to get x squared minus 6. Keep in mind now that we can factor that further. So the x squared plus 4, that can be factored into x plus and minus 2. But be careful there, because it's a plus, if we do a plus and a minus, we're going to get a negative 4. So remember there to get it back to positive, we need to incorporate i's. That's the only time that those i's are going to show up. Now we don't need to do that on the x squared minus 6. That one, we don't know the square root of 6, so we just leave it. So we're going to say x plus square root of 6 and x minus square root of 6. If that was a 9, we would have done 3 and 3. But because we don't know the square root, we just leave it with the symbol. 
Let's try one more example here just to make sure you've got it. Similar question to what we just did, but we're going to try it again. The thing that I see that's repeated that I want to pull out is x squared minus 4. So I'm going to replace that with another letter like u. So now when I rewrite this without x squared minus 4, I'm going to put in a u in its place. And so I end up with this new equation. I want to try to factor that as much as I can. So I'm going to use the diamond again. Factors of 9 that add up to negative 6 are going to be negative 3 and negative 3. So now I'm going to factor with u minus 3 and u minus 3 again. So the factors end up being the same this time. Now let's plug the u back in. So in place of u, I want to put what it was. It was x squared minus 4. And I'm just going to do that twice, x squared minus 4 again. Now I'm going to simplify here. I get x squared minus 7 in both cases. And so because that's a difference of squares, I can factor those further into x plus x minus. And I don't know the square root of 7, so I'm just going to leave it as square root of 7 in both cases. And then I need to do that again because my other factor is identical. So x plus square root of 7 and x minus square root of 7. And that's as far as I can go. There is one last example that I'd like to do. This one is for pre-calculus students or students who are headed to pre-calculus. This one's more of a trig example, and so it's not one that will be tested on this year, but it's one that you're going to see again if you take pre-calc. So this one is not one that we're going to cover during class. It will only be covered here in the video. We're still going to use substitution here. The thing that is repeated is the cosine of x. So I'm going to pull that out and I'm going to call that u. Now I'm going to rewrite the problem. Wherever I see a cosine of x, I'm going to replace that with the letter u instead. So I get 2u squared minus 3u plus 1 equals 0. And so now we're going to factor that and then I think because it's equal to 0 here it should actually say and solve. So now I'm going to try to factor that. Because the leading coefficient is not a 1 here, I'm going to need to do the diamond and the grid. If this was a 1 like the other two that we had done, we would just do the diamond and be finished. So remember on the top of your diamond or your x, you're going to do a 2. On the bottom, you're going to do a negative 3. So the only way to get factors of 2 that add up to negative 3 is if they're both negative. Keep in mind that when you do your grid now, the numbers that are going to be negative are going to get forced to be here and here. So that's only when the middle number is negative. In the middle of my grid, I'm going to do 2u squared. The bottom of the grid, I'm going to do a 1. And then I'm going to grab my negative 2 and my negative 1, and I'm going to put u's with them. So negative 2u here, negative 1u, or just negative u here. Now I'm going to find GCFs vertically. So between negative 2u and 1, the only common factor there is a 1, and I'm going to force it to be negative. Vertically here, the only thing in common is a u. So my first answer is going to be u minus 1. Going across now, my only common factor there is a 2u. Down here, the only common factor here is a 1, and I need to make sure that that is negative. So I'm going to say 2u minus 1 here. If you're not sure if that's the correct answer, remember you can always do FOIL here and see if you get the original back. Now remember to set these equal to 0, and if they're equal to 0, that means one of them is a 0. So I'm going to go ahead and set them equal to 0 individually. So that's kind of an algebra thing. If two numbers are multiplied together to make 0, then one of them must be 0. So I'm going to set them equal to 0 separately. And I'm going to plug back in what I had originally substituted out. So here I'm going to get cosine of x minus 1 equals 0. And 2 times the cosine of x minus 1 equals 0. And so now I'm going to solve those for x. So you're just going to use your algebra skills here. Here I'm going to add 1 to both sides. So I get cosine of x equals 1. And then over here I have to, let's see here, i got to add 1 and divide by 2. So if I add 1 and divide by 2, I'm just going to get a half. So now I need students to travel back in time a little bit and think about your unit circle. 
Hopefully you're not moaning and groaning too much when you hear that. And your answers here need to be in radians. So we're going to figure it out in degrees first, and then we'll convert it to radians as needed from there. So think about where the cosine is going to be equal to a 1. So remember, we always start our unit circle here. And that coordinate is the point zero, 1, 0. And remember that the cosine is the x value and the sine is the y value. So the cosine is 1 right away at 0 degrees. So I'm going to say that x is equal to 0. Keep in mind that that number repeats every time you go around the circle. So remember when we talked about the general solutions? We want to add 2 pi n onto that, where n represents how many times around the circle you repeat. So this is in radians, so we don't need to put the degree symbol in. For the other answer, we want to figure out where is the cosine going to have an answer of a half. So let's go to the next click up on our unit circle. Remember that one is square root of 3 over 2 and then half. So the half there is for the sine, not the cosine. So that means the answer we're looking for here is up at 60 degrees. So we know the answer for x is 60 degrees, but we need to give our answer in radians. It didn't say that in the directions, students just need to know that radians is uh, going to be required on these types of questions. So normally the directions will be there. We didn't have any on this one, but they would be there normally. So if x is a 60 degree answer, we want to convert that to radians. And when we do that, remember we multiply by pi over 180. When you simplify 60 pi over 180, you're going to get pi over 3. And so that's our value for x here. And then remember that those also repeat every 2 pi n.